right, Suzanne Four, and Officer Catherine Winters of the LGBT Alliance of the SFPD. Hi, you two. Hello. We've Hi. been we've been texting a lot the last couple of days. We have. like you know on your phone where you can like I don't know if you have iPhones or Android, but you can like bloop like make someone go to the pin. I feel like I should have pinned both of you because there's been so many text messages. You're like my you're my top contacts. That's so, so cute to be pinned. Yes. Yeah, well. So. Hi. Um, first of all, like I was saying to you outside, I'm so honored that you would honor me and trust me with this conversation at this moment because it, it feels so kismet. It's literally day one of Pride at Manny's, and we're having this conversation. So we sure know how to pick. The conversation and so but we got to talk about this stuff right like we actually have to talk in person so thank you very much for doing it i feel like the first thing we have to talk about is what everyone else just discussed which is their favorite pride memory i want to hear what your favorite pride memory now just fyi it's just the three of us so don't hold back what's your favorite so, pride so, memory? so no one else is in the room right no now. one else is in the room <laughs> figment of your imagination uh i will actually say my my favorite Pride memory was the first time I got to march in Pride with my daughters, um, who are now, um, they're now 16, 18, but it was 2018, I got to march with my daughters um, and my niece. And uh, that was just the most amazing experience to, to be able to bring my daughters along to Pride um, and really share in the celebration that day. And when was that, officer? That was in 2019. Got it. Oh, and I'm sorry. And call me Catherine, please. Okay. <laughs> yeah. T take a second uh, when you answer this question. Tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of why you're here and, and what you do for the SFPD. A little bit. You want me to keep it short? Just a little bit. Just so we only have one hour. So. Okay. All right. Um, so my name is Catherine Winters. Uh, I'm a police officer with the San Francisco Police Department. Um, I first joined in 1998. Um, and... I did leave the department in 2006 and moved to Texas, um, which is where I went through my gender transition because California is too easy, right? Let's go to Texas. <laughs> um, and aside from, from working a, a soul crushing corporate job in Texas, I spent a lot of time working on trans causes on statewide, local organizations, uh, grassroots efforts around LGBTQ youth, um, working against a lot of the, the legislation that we tend to pop up in Texas. Um, actually applied to a police department in Texas while I was living out there. Um, pretty about 99.9% .9 sure the reason why they told me I couldn't move further in the process was because of who I am uh, and living my authentic life. So in 2018, I came back to San Francisco. Uh, so I've been back in the San Francisco Police Department for a little bit over four years now was born and raised in San Francisco, grew up pretty much in the Castro, uh, back living in the city. So uh, back in the city, I love in, in a job and pressure because I, if I wasn't able to do law enforcement in Texas, because I really felt trans representation law enforcement was important, I figured the next best was to come back to where I came from. Well, welcome back. Thank you. Ms. Ford. Hi, everyone. My name is Suzanne Ford. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, you should know that I was born and raised in Kentucky. You might hear a little bit of an accent. Um, I have been here in the Bay Area for almost 15 years. Um, I transitioned um, about nine years ago in place same job with my same wife, family, right in the middle of Novato, which was a little bit of a uh, task. I was very famous at the local Safeway. <laughs> that joke went right over my head. I did not get that. <laughs> what was the joke? Well, people would come down aisle five, and then they might circle back around to see the tall red-headed trans uh, woman. I see, I see, I see. There aren't a lot of us in Novato, if you don't know. Um, I, I thought it was a supermarket joke, like Safeway versus other supermarkets. No, it could have happened at Ralph's. I don't know. Okay. Um, you know, when I transitioned, I met Teresa Sparks, who became my mentor. Um, and I, you know, I had fought for other people's rights my, during my life. I went to Howard Law School. I've always been interested in civil rights, but I didn't, I didn't fight for my own rights. I hid and I hid for a lot of years. I was, uh, 
46 years old when I transitioned. So I spent a lot of time not living an authentic life. And ever since I've transitioned, I've known I wanted to give back. Um, I have a lot of trans friends, especially my black trans friends that they didn't have that luxury of hiding like I did. And um, so I got involved in San Francisco in the trans community. And then I was introduced into the pride community. And I have served for three and a half years on the board of directors at San Francisco Pride. I've been treasurer and vice president. And then last year I was treasurer again. Fred Lopez left and I was lucky enough to be trusted with this thing that you're all here about. You wouldn't be here so interested if it weren't that it was San Francisco Pride. And I know that and I carry that and, and my staff carries that. And, and we know that what it means to this city, this community. And yeah, we know it touches almost everybody in this community. And there's these people doing things that you don't know about. They get done and you never know about it. And it's, it's quite a responsibility and most of them don't get paid. I'm painfully aware of that for most of the people that do the work for San Francisco Pride, they don't get paid. Uh, my favorite moment, I was, uh, at, I, I was on the board of directors of the Spar Center in Marin. I was at a picnic. And it was a couple of weeks before Pride. And this woman came up with an eight, eight or nine year old child. And she said, we heard you were the person to talk to. We want to go to San Francisco Pride. And, and they told us that you know about it. And um, I thought for a minute, I was like, oh, you, you know, you could march with us. The resistance contingent, which is the board's contingent, is at the front of the parade right behind the dikes on bikes. And I said, if you come there Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and find me, we'll take care of you. And I, I forgot about it. I um, got busy and then Sunday morning, it was insane. We were down there where all the people start the parade and this little kid tugged on my shirt and it was that little kid. And they were a newly out non-binary child. They had just came out to their parents a couple of weeks before. So we were able to put them on holding the, ban the banner, the San Francisco Pride banner at the front of the SF Pride Parade. That's my favorite moment. That's the business that San Francisco Pride is in. And uh, yeah, so. Before I go deeper in the conversation, I wanna let you all know kind of what the plan is. So we're gonna talk for a little bit, we're talking about 30 minutes or something, and then there will be opportunity for audience question and answer. My only request is if, you, if we talk about something or we say something that makes you feel a certain way while we're talking, keep it to yourself uh, and then express it when it's time for audience Q and A, because what's I think really beautiful about this room is as I look around and you guys are looking at us, but I can see all of you. We got a real mixed audience in here, right? We've got folks in uniform, folks not in uniform, and it's super important for me that everyone feels welcome and safe here. So, um, like we do for all of our other tough conversation series, we try to keep our audience reactions to as much of a minimum as possible, just to make sure everyone feels comfortable expressing themselves when it's time. So this is about uniforms, huh? I guess before we get into it, I would love to just hear some context because I feel like for the, the average person like myself, I started reading about this in the news kind of recently. Like I remember murmurs in the past and there were conversations, but it really became like a story recently. So I guess maybe starting with you, Suzanne, can you talk about the genesis of the decision uh, by Pride and the Pride board to uh, that, you know, is kind of why we're all here and what has started this kind of uh, Hot, this kind of focus on pride. So how did we get here? Um, so there, there has been um, part of our community, um, a lot of the trans community, black and brown members of our community, more progressive members of our community that have questioned why we have the police in the parade. It's not something that's new. We've heard that, you know, from part of our community for several years. In 2019, we had a protest they were protesting two things, police involvement in the parade and corporate sponsorship of pride. And <clears throat> so the parade was stopped. Um, the pride board, um, the president of the board and members were up there negotiating with the protesters. And, and it was a difficult situation because the parade was stopped. A lot of people were angry and it was an intense situation. I was not, I was, taking care of other things around what was happening. So I wasn't directly involved in the conversation. Um, at one point, there was a decision to arrest the protesters. 
um, I think three protesters were arrested if I remember correctly, but one of the protesters was injured. Um, they later they later sued the city and I believe the city sued with them for settled with them for $190,000. We came under fire from our community about the treatment of the protesters. Um, I'm really not here to litigate who was at fault in that, but I have to tell you that as the executive director of San Francisco Pride, I'm responsible for all the participants in the parade, the, the spectators, if protesters show up, I'm responsible for them too. And people were angry with San Francisco Pride over the treatment of the protesters. So that's what started the discussion for us. The board made a decision not to allow uniformed officers to march in the parade for 2020 due to the outpouring in our community of people, our board meetings were jam packed with people very angry with San Francisco Pride. And we tried to respond to our community. Of course, we did not have the parade in 2020. We didn't have the parade in 2021. So this issue got put on the back burner. We all know what happened after 2019 as far as policing in the United States and the pressure that grew out of what the Floyd family experienced, what George Floyd, that situation. And we all know about how we all were involved in one way or another in the conversation about policing in the United States growing out of that. Can we get, look at those, the, the everyone smushed back there. Oh, right, let's get some, oh, we're getting more chairs. Okay, good. Yeah, you're good, okay. I'm, so, a, I'm a Jewish, I'm a, it's a Jewish owned business. I'm you know, conscious of everyone's comfort. Sorry, Suzanne. No, it's okay. Um, so, of course, going into 2022, you know, what were we going to do? Were we going to stick to what we had said in 2019? Members of our community wanted to know. We started conversations with um, the Pride Alliance and with Catherine, and we hoped to, to find a way that we could say to our community, we hear you. We hear about your concerns about the police. We know about the history of the police. But we also wanted to find a way to include the Pride Alliance, to honor them, to let them march together. Um, in March, we made a proposal to Catherine and the Pride Alliance. Um, there were three points, but the fourth point, the sticking point was <clears throat> we asked them not to march in full uniform. Uh, we did not get a response until last Monday when the press release came out with the position of the Pride Alliance. And so that's why I'm here. Okay. Thank you for that, Suzanne. I appreciate it. So you were with the Pride Alliance. You get this set of agreements. And I'm sure you knew about the history of what happened in 2019 and all that. I was actually in that Pride. I was marching with, I think, Mark Leno or someone. And I, I was actually at the front line. I saw everyone chained to each other. So I was there. When you got this notice, what was your reaction? What were the conversations within the LGBT Pride Alliance? Maybe tell folks what the Pride Alliance is within the SFPD. Yeah, and just to be a little bit more accurate on, on the timeline is and we- And both of you, keep please keep the yeah. microphone near your uh, mouth. There are the, the four things that the Pride Board asked of us, and um, we had had a few conversations after that where the uniforms were still a sticking point. Um, but so, just for everyone's information, like the, the four points were one, that we not march in uniform. Uh, two were that we issue a um, joint statement of values between the police department and San Francisco Pride. Um, the third one was that San Francisco Pride, uh, with the help of Pride Alliance, work with the police department to establish uh, some guidelines on how we police the event, and how we handle if there were another to be another protest. Um, so really how we, um, how we sh as police officers show up for the event and what we do in certain circumstances. And then the fourth was to, to have a joint town hall between uh, queer police officers and Pride Board uh, sometime after Pride. As we I was gonna say, yeah. hello. Hello, I guess we're, I, I guess you're bringing that Check point mark home. Checkmark on one. Checkmark. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> okay, we're done. Yeah, um, and and those those other three points were were things that Pride Alliance absolutely uh, embraced and and felt were important. So talk to me about the uniform because I've had conversations in advance of this with folks in uniform, some of whom are in this room. 
We had a beautiful moment at Manny's last week where we had a little incident where folks in uniform were asked to leave and then we brought some of the folks here with the folks that asked them and we listened and heard about what the uniform means yeah. and what being what it's like to be someone who has to put on a uniform, you know, go from civilian clothes to a uniform every day. So from the perspective of someone who wears a uniform for her job, tell me and maybe the folks in here that don't know what it's like, what does the uniform mean to you? Oh, it, you know, there's there's kind of two parts to it. There's there's a daily part for me where when I put on my uniform, when I pin the star on my uniform every day, um, there's a sense of responsibility to my community. Um, like I mentioned, I'm born and raised in this city. I still live in this city. Um, and there's, there's a, a sense of responsibility that I have to go out there every day um, and help people and help people on what's oftentimes their worst day. Um, and I have to show up for them in ways that um, are sensitive to, to what they're going through. Um, I can't let it be my worst day when it's their worst day. Um, and on the other hand, there's also, for me, as a, as a trans woman, there, there's this, this recognition that there were LGBTQ officers before me who, who had to fight for their right to be a police officer. Um, a, B, they had to fight for the right to be able to march and pride in a uniform. Um, and those officers put themselves at, out there at a time when, you know, it was a whole different world to be LGBTQ. Like you could be fired even in, in California. Um, yeah, so there's a sense of responsibility to, to, to my elders. I'm gonna ask you one more set of, what do you say to the people who say that? And I'm gonna ask the same to you. Yeah. What do you say to the people who say, I mean, they're letting you march in pride. They're just asking you to put a t-shirt on. It can say SFPD. They're not asking you to hide and be in a closet. Like, as I've talked to my friends, they're like, it doesn't seem like that should be that big of a deal. It's a compromise. They're allowed to march in pride. They're just asking them to wear a t-shirt, not the uniform. Isn't that a fair compromise? So what is, when, when people say that or when folks express that, what is your reaction to that? So when I hear that, you know, again, going back to, the, there were my LGBTQ elders in the department who fought for the right to wear a uniform in pride. We fought against the department with the support of our community. Um, and at a time when there's parts of the country where our rights as LGBTQ people are legitimately at risk, um, the idea that we would ask any part of our community to give up a right at a time when there's parts of the country where trans kids cannot access gender affirming care. I mean, it break, I, I just, I can't imagine that we would ask anyone within our community to give up a right. And there are parts of this country where officers who come out are fired because they have no employment protections. They can never march in pride in a uniform. So for you, it's a, uh, a matter of principle that pride is about anyone being able to show up however they are. And that includes if you're an officer, you should be able to show up in uniform or without. Is that, am I hearing that right? No. I this is like the main, I think this is the main crux. So I wanna make sure I really understand this point. It's not just about that it's pride and we should be able to show up as who we want. It's the struggles of LGBTQ officers mirror those of the greater LGBTQ community. Like we had to fight for our place in departments um, and it wasn't always easy. Um, we, we, you know, during the AIDS crisis, we lost so many of our, our closeted gay male members to the AIDS crisis. What's your reaction to that, Suzanne? You're hearing Catherine express her feelings about mm -hmm. this, and I want to give you the opportunity to respond to what, what, you, what she just said. Well, first of all, I don't think that we, we did realize that it, we were asking them for something. I, I want to acknowledge that. We, I think it, it wasn't a little thing that we asked. I, I understand that. I used to have a uniform on. We, we've had this discussion. I used to wear a U.S. Army uniform, and 
I knew the person beside me would die for me because of that uniform, and it was a unifying thing, and I realized that. And I know it would be a hard thing if you asked Army veterans not to wear that uniform. However, we're not talking about the Army. We're talking about the police. And in my mind, the police is about the community. And parts of our community have felt a lot of pain about the police. Now, San Francisco Pride can't solve that. We're, we're not equipped for that. But what San Francisco Pride has done and will always do is that's the one place in the community, in the LGBTQ community, I don't care if it's a really unpopular thing, you can come and be heard. And we heard the police that wanted to march. We heard the community that didn't want them there. And we thought, A, we don't want them to hide, and B, we do want to honor. I know that there's been a lot of progress in the San Francisco Police Department as far as representation. But we're not done yet. And visibility is great, but that's not the goal. Liberation is the goal. And that's one of our mission statements, to liberate our people. And our people include everybody. And the, the hate and the anger that I've fielded, my staff has fielded this week in the San Francisco Pride Office, when we should be trying to undertake this huge thing that we are struggling. Can you imagine not doing it in two years? And most of the anger has come from older white people, mostly gay men and some lesbians, but almost 99.9% of the people that I know, it was from white people in our community. And you know, I know in, I know if I follow the rules, I don't break the law, I'm pretty sure tonight I'm gonna be fine. I don't get nervous when I see police officers. When Catherine and I see each other, I don't feel that fear, but I know there are people in our community that don't feel that way. And I'm with those people, I'm in their communities and I'm responsible to them. And I'm trying to find the solution, but the people with the power in this equation are the police, not San Francisco Pride. We're five people on a staff with a bunch of volunteers trying to put on a parade. The people in this equation are the, with the power are the police. We asked them to wear some polos or t-shirts. We didn't ask them to be unarmed. I think that if I was looking at it from the outside and I was worried about the bigger, and I, I, I'm I, from the South and I know about these anti-trans legislation, I know what it's doing to trans kids and their parents. If I had the decision-making to avoid all this, I think I would have said, you know what, we, we're not gonna do it forever, but this year we'll put on a polo and we'll show up and we'll continue to have this discussion in hopes that we come to a better place have more conversations within our community, more people feel safe, and hopefully in the future we go back to full uniforms. But you know what? I, I, don't, I don't have that decision making, but I, I think it's disingenuous to act like San Francisco Pride has all this power in this because the police have been upset with this, the mayor's upset with this, white powerful people in the city are upset with this. You know, I walked into a, an office at the Civic Center on Wednesday to talk about security for this event to keep everyone safe. There were eight police officers looking at me after what happened in the media on Monday. And, you know, I, they treated me fine. We, we got through it. But I have to tell you, for a second, I wasn't sure about how they were going to treat me because I knew I made the police force in San Francisco angry. And that's just a small touch of what other people in our community feel and who we're going to make sure that they're heard. Thank you for sharing that. I want to ask you what it feels like to hear that folks in our community that maybe don't look like us can see you in uniform and feel fear and don't feel safe around you. Because one of the things that came up in our little conversation that we had in, in, inside was this sense, and I don't wanna make false equivalencies because it, it isn't the same, right? Officers have a gun, civilians don't. Uh, so there's a power differential, 
but this feeling of uh, both feeling unwelcome. There are some people that see an officer in uniform and immediately feel like I'm not, I can't be here. I don't feel welcome here because there's someone in uniform. What I heard too, though it's not the same, but there's a similar emotion, is the feeling like the second you put on this uniform, no matter who you are or what your story is, you may you might not feel welcome in a space because because of this uniform, you you create this, there's this atmosphere around it. So what does what is your reaction to that and how does that make you feel? Um, I mean, that's something that since I came back to the department, I've had to to contend with since I put on uniform because um, the minute I made the decision and, and came back to the department, there were people and spaces I was no longer allowed in whether or not I had my uniform on. There were people I fought some really good fights with in Texas side by side for the rights of trans people in Texas who, who won't talk to me anymore simply because I came back to the police department because I felt this was the best way that I could serve my community. But I understand, I, I know that for many people have different experiences with the uniform. Um, but I've also first seen firsthand the power that my representation in the uniform has. I walked the Castro footbeat for a while and there were a number of homeless trans women in the Castro who, when I would approach them and, and they would look at me and they would make the realization that I was also trans and they would say, are, are you trans? And I would say, yes, they would soften, smile. They, one said, then you understand, you understand what I'm going through. You understand how hard it is. I do have to push back on that a teeny bit by saying like, what would, we can't rely just on the officers that are in our community to be enough, right? Like it might be one thing for a trans woman to see you and say, you're also a trans woman. So in this moment, I feel safe. But what I'm hearing is a lot of the issues that are where pride, I think maybe unfortunately pride is being used as like, the, the example of the moment, but we're dealing with issues that are way beyond just LGBT officers in uniform, but an issue with police as a institution and all of the, not recent, but recently brought to the attention uh, that's made this the zeitgeist. So I guess my question maybe to both of you is, <clears throat> pride seems to be, it's being made an example of a much larger issue. And I have to say, as just a common observer of it, I'm sad because it's pride and pride was a riot and a protest and it has evolved into what, at least in my perspective, is a celebration of all the aspects of our community, especially this damn pride, right? So how do you feel about where it's gone, how it's, where it is now, about the place that we sit in now on June fucking 1st, 2022? How are you feeling about pride this year and how are you feeling about it? I'm sad. Um a significant portion of my energy has been this matter instead of making sure that we have the celebration. We came out of a pandemic. San Francisco Pride hasn't had real revenue in two years. We needed to raise $2 million eight weeks ago to make sure that everybody in the city has a free, free, San Francisco Pride is free. We're almost, almost the only one left. So I feel at one hand, I'm like, I'm like angry, but then the second part of me knows we're uniquely situated to have these conversations. I don't think that San Francisco pride should be and put it in the place where we're gonna solve them. We cannot solve policing in America. We cannot solve the rainbow washing of pride, but we can do a better job of being the platform where these discussions like this, and I'm, I'm, I'm super glad we're having it. When we come out of this celebration, get on the other side, if I keep my job, um, I promise you that we need to start having a discussion in this community and it's generational because young people see one thing, older people see another. I'm, I'm an older person in our, our community. I do remember when you would never have been a police officer in Owensboro, Kentucky, where I grew up. I, and I, I get that we have to celebrate all the work that's been done, but we have to realize in our community that there's a ton of work still to go and young people 
they demand that we keep doing that work. And so, you know, I know that if we get on the other side of this, we're just going to start having more conversations in our community where everybody can come. And I encourage the young queer people I know to listen to the people that did the work in the 70s and 80s and to honor them. They should. They don't, they don't do it enough. But on the other hand, if you think that San Francisco Pride is the same white organization it was, it's not anymore. This board is half trans. It looks like our queer community now. And we're going to start, San Francisco Pride is, we're going to do the work that our community demands of us. And it's going to look a little different. And we want you to join us. Be part of the solution. Thank you. How are you feeling about Pride this year? And I know you can't speak for the entire SFPD, but as you talk to other officers about, I gotta say, the drama of the last week, and I think the gay community is boycotting the mayor for boycotting the police, for boycotting Pride, for boycotting the police at this point. I think I got that right. So, we're all, so how do you feel about Pride this year? Um, first of all, I don't like the word boycott because we've just decided, made a statement that we're not gonna march. Um, boycott implies that we're telling everybody to stay away and Got we it. want Got everybody it. to come to San Francisco and enjoy Pride because it is absolutely the best month in San Francisco, in my opinion. Um, but I'm just, I'm not feeling it this year. Um, and um, that's hard for me because 2019, when I shared when I marched with my daughters was also my first time marching as an out trans woman in my uniform. And when I came around the corner on the market and heard the cheers for us, I literally broke down in tears. Um, it was one of the most emotionally moving experiences of my life. And um, it was because it was for the first time I got to bring all of me to pride. Me as a trans woman, me as a mother, me as a police officer, as a San Franciscan, as everything that I am, walked on the Market Street that day. Gosh, I really hope that you can march this year. Like, I, I don't know, I'm an optimist. I'm just maybe a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed gay Afghan Jewish man up here. But like, <laughs> I really hope we can figure this shit out in the next three weeks because I do, I do want, I do want, because I want you to march. I want, I want to find a way for you to march. And I want to find a way for you to lead your organization with dignity. You know, I grew up in an ultra-Orthodox Jewish family. I didn't even know. I wasn't even allowed to talk to non-Jews until I was 15. So being gay, if I had come out, I would have been kicked out of my school, excommunicated from my family. I remember having a bag packed in my closet with my Social Security card, enough food for a week, clothes to last on the street in case somehow my family found out I was gay. I knew exactly where I would go. I knew what my route would be. So when I first marched in Pride, it was almost like cognitive dissonance. It was like, not that long ago, just to say those three letters was like ending my life in a way. I had to completely change it. Now here I am marching and all these people can see me. So the thing about Pride that is so, we all know, and I think a lot of us in the audience, is what makes Pride relevant is that people are still, still have to come out every single day, right? We're all born... I guess, I don't know anymore about the younger generations, but presumably we're all still assumed to be straight and we all have to find a way if we're not to let the people in our community know and pride can be that moment for us. So it will constantly be useful and it's necessary. And so that's why I think it's really important that as San Francisco, we work this out. We're gonna get to audience questions in a second. Uh, I wanna ask about the mayor because the mayor does, is, is the symbol of our city, the executive of our city. And so I want to ask from both of you what it felt like to hear that the mayor was not going to march in pride. Um, and this is not a gotcha to the mayor, but I do think it's historic that the mayor of San Francisco isn't going to be marching. And so I want to hear you. I want to hear for you what it felt like as an officer in uniform. And then, Suzanne, I want to hear as the as the uh, person who runs pride, what it felt like for you. So so go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, to have the support of the mayor. Um, for me, it was hugely significant because Mayor Breed is, I think, more uniquely situated than almost any politician in the city, having grown up in the Western Edition and seen the damage bad policing can do to a community 
but also recognize the value that good policing can bring to a community. Um, and so I, you know, I felt that her support was significant because she understands the complexity of policing, but she also understands how important it is that everyone in this community be supported and uplifted that we, you know, there was a time in the city that so many of us couldn't serve openly and we can now. And, um, you know, I, just the fact that she recognizes that pride is about bringing everyone together and allowing them to bring their whole selves to pride is significant for me. Okay, Suzanne, how did that feel like when, and how did you hear that the mayor was gonna not march? Well, um, I wanna say that the mayor's office has communicated with us, uh, been clear about what the mayor wanted, um, and they've been very professional. There were ongoing discussions, and so they, um, they, they let me know that morning, and I felt like I got punched in the gut. Um, you know, it's the first time I've sat in that chair to have the mayor not show up for the for the first time that I've led the organization, my ego was a little hurt because surely the mayor doesn't want to do that to Suzanne. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> no, um, I was disappointed. I wasn't, and I and I think too, like in the last two and a half months having this job, I don't have I had any idea of all the considerations that the mayor must have to look at in order to make decisions. I know even in Pride, when I looked at decisions that were made, I didn't understand all the implications and I do now for, for my job right now. So I don't wanna criticize the mayor and I wanna leave the door open. Um, we disagree on this, but that doesn't mean that we, the mayor's always had a good relationship with San Francisco Pride. She's been a supporter of San Francisco Pride and I'm sure she will be in the future. She has her constituency that she answers to, and we have ours. And so, you know what? I respectfully disagree, but we are working with the mayor's office to make sure that all of you will be safe and the police department. We're going to do that job, and we're going to be professionals, and we're going to move forward. I want to ask you to ask the person next to you a question that's on your mind. Let me start with you, Suzanne. Did you really ever consider wearing polos instead of a full uniform? Um, I mean, I-, I Audience? <laughs> um, the idea of polos was something that was never brought up until an email a couple days ago. So and let's be honest, a polo, what queer person is gonna wear a polo? I mean. <laughs> We haven't worn a polo since 1992. <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, is it fitted? Are we two buttons? Okay, go ahead. Sorry, it is a serious question. Yeah. Or t-shirt. Plug in t-shirt there. Any shirt. Um, did I think about it? Yes. Um, of course I did because. I took all of the, the asks that were handed to us. I didn't just dismiss it off the bat. I, um, I thought about it. I, I had to put some thought into it. I had to, to talk to people. Um, I'm not one just to, to, to make a decision offhand um, because within that ask and the, the other three asks were, were you know really three things that I felt could bring the community together and that we could, could reach a better compromise on, on the fourth. You know, we were asked to do four things and we agreed to three of the four. Okay, so you did consider it yeah. and after some considera consideration, you felt like that was a shade too far. Same, yeah. same, same ask. Um, Tough to, to, to find a, you know, because at the, it, you know, perhaps at the end of the day, like I have a huge amount of respect for Suzanne and the Pride organization and 
having to balance all the needs of, of our very diverse communities. Um, and my, my question for Suzanne is, what do you say to those people who say LGBTQ officers aren't part of the community? No, I would, <clears throat> I think I've made sure in any time I was interviewed or questioned about this, I absolutely know that the LGBTQ officers are part of our community. You're my trans sibling. There's no way around that. And I think, I, I think we stood up to people in our community that don't see you as that, and that's not a huge number, but they exist. They have every right to make that known, but I don't agree with them. If I didn't think you were in the community, then I would be against you marching at all. And I don't hold that position. I definitely think we ought to honor the police officers that are LGBTQ and serving in San Francisco, but I think you should show up in a different way. All right, my la thank you for doing that, and I appreciate it. My last question before we get to the audience is about what a compromise could look like. So the hard thing about this, and this is kind of the world we live in, is people have posted things, social media is out there, everyone's opinionated, everyone's said what they're going to do, and I'm not doing this, I'm doing this. And it makes it really hard, I think, at this point to maybe come to a, a new agreement based on all the things that have been said. Because unfortunately, we live in a world where it's not just us sitting in a room, it's anyone in the world that's watching us. And the world is watching us right now because we are San Francisco and people come here from all over the world to be queer, especially places where it isn't safe. So I guess my question to you all is like, what could happen? Let's, let's forget this, everyone else in this room. Seriously, like just the three of us, if it was just the three of us sitting here, like would some kind of, you marched in t-shirts this year, but you were able to march in uniform next year. Firefighters marched in uniform, they were in uniform on their trucks, but they were in shirts on the ground. Like what might a, a compromise look like to allow pride this year to go on in a way where the mayor marched, the officers marched and the community felt heard? Please. Um, please know that we, the board of directors voted that no law enforcement agencies could march in full uniform. We never intended that the firefighters wouldn't. We didn't say that. The firefighters on their own decided to join um, Catherine and their organization in not marching, but but we did not ask them that before right. we get to that. Right, right, right. They did that in solidarity yes. with the folks that that also have to put on uniform every day. So question to you, what what are you just putting this out there? What might you need to hear or or, or is there any space for you to think about as, as a representative of the Pride Alliance to come back to the negotiating table and consider marching again? That also understands that Suzanne has not just an organization, but a very wide and diverse community that's watching what she does and make sure that she doesn't do anything that breaks their trust. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things I've been watching closely the last week is San Diego, San Diego which has reached a compromise um, and allowed officers to march. Um, and that came from a lot of, of really good discussions with a lot of people. Um, and sure, no one is ever going to be happy with a decision. Um, and, you know, we're not going to solve the history of policing here today. We're not going to solve the history of policing with whatever happens in the future around LGBTQ officers and, and pride. Um, and I want to march more than anything. Um, you know, that it's hugely important to me because um, there are still officers who can't march in pride parades. Um, but, you know, I, I, I want something, or I would like to see, I, I don't want to use want because it's about discussions about like reaching something that's mutually agreeable that that honors our community and honors the service of LGBTQ officers and the struggles of those who came before us. Um, Cause it's, that's what pride is all about is honoring the struggle of those who, who fought to get us to where we all are today. Um, and I want 
a compromise that truly honors the struggle of the LGBTQ officers who put everything on the line to be able to serve openly and proudly and march in uniform. Ooh, Suzanne's got something to say. Yeah, um, it's been misreported. Um, I'm on the phone with San Diego Pride on a regular basis. Um, Fernando Lopez, the executive director, um, I was on the phone with him yesterday morning. They, they interviewed one deputy sheriff, um, deputy from the sheriff's department that said, hey, we're, it's great, we're marching in our uniform. Actually, the San Diego Police Department agreed after meeting with the community in a discussion fostered by San Diego Pride, the San Diego Police Department has agreed to march in matching polos. And they will continue the discussion and they'll talk about next year. There was no nothing binding for the next year, but there was a pledge to continue the discussion. Um, and there, they recommended their board, their language in the agreement. It recommended that the police department find a way to honor the history of pride, to honor the spirit of pride first, not being a police officer. But it left it open to the police department to come up with their solution because it did recognize in the end that we understand you have to have professional attire. And I understand that. And I, I, so, you know, I don't have the answer about what the compromise would look like. I think it would, again, we made this a, we made the proposal in March. We heard from the press release what the answer was, but we've not heard a, a counter proposal from the police. Well, we'll march in this uniform or we'll march looking like this. We've not heard that. So for me, what a compromise would look like would be a proposal from the Pride Alliance. We will march this way and it would be different than exactly how Catherine's sitting here today. I don't know what it exactly looks like. And I only speak for a board. The board of directors at San Francisco Pride will vote on this. They voted unanimously 10 to zero for the, for the proposal that we gave in March. Are you willing to put together a counter proposal? Um, yeah, and there are a couple of things like, cause I just, I talked to uh, a representative of San Diego PD today and there seems to be some conflict. I don't know what the actual agreement was in San Diego. Cause I was told on my way here tonight that the agreement was that they can march in their uniform as long as they show something outwardly supportive of of LGBTQ causes. I see. So it sounds like the four of you <laughs> yeah. need, need to, to get sit together down and figure out <laughs> yeah. what the hell's going on. Uh, but but and, back and, to Suzanne's yeah. kind of request combine, like, you know, they sent y'all a proposal. And I'm sorry, audience, I want to get to your questions, but I do want to yeah. just, this is the last thing. I want to get to their questions. Yes. Too. But they sent you a proposal. You haven't sent a proposal back and say, well, this is what we're comfortable um, wearing. You don't have to say what it is now, but are you willing to maybe? speak with the rest of the Pride Alliance and come back to the SF Pride, we have three weeks and to say, yeah. here's maybe where we could meet in the middle. Absolutely. And and I'm, I, I don't want to come across as argumentative, but the proposal was sent to us and we actually had a meeting. It wasn't sent the proposal to us and we released our press release. We actually had a meeting, actually two meetings. I had a couple conversations between the proposal, what this is, what our asks are. And, and our press release. So there was dialogue that went on between that. Um, it wasn't, here's what we ask, and then we sent out a press release. Um, because I'm very committed to dialogue, and we had a discussion. Um, there okay. were, were a few conversations that happened before then. Okay, so here is my, as, as, as the Manny of this stage, I will just say this, as, and, and just with Mishpacha up here, I really do hope that we can figure this out in the next three weeks. I do. I do. I do. Honestly, I don't want my mayor not marching in pride. I don't care if her name is London Breed or Paris Breed. I don't care who she is or who he is, anything. But this is San Francisco. This is the city of Harvey Milk. And I am, I believe in us that we can work this out. Because even though I'm annoyed that pride is becoming the stage for this issue because I think it needs it needs to be this and I think at the very least it, but here we are we're on this stage we're talking so I really hope that 
the two of you and the organizations you represent can find a way to have this parade happen uh, that heals more than hurts. Let's get to audience questions. All right, um, let's go to Lieutenant Baxter. In the end, I just outed you, but there you go, <laughs> Lieutenant Baxter. And maybe yes. if you are in uniform, please say kind of who you work for, that kind of thing. And yes, Darian's gonna hold the microphone in front of you just to, we have a process here. You can ask your question, they'll answer. I didn't want to seem broody and say he's holding the microphone for me. I did try. <laughs> so good afternoon, uh, you know, Madam President. Thank you for being here. Officer Winters, owner of this fine establishment. Manny, thanks for having us in our amazing community. My name is Jonathan Baxter. I'm a lieutenant with San Francisco Fire Department. I'm a multiracial, proud gay man. Today is the first day in 50 years and five months that I've ever said that in open public because I have been afraid. I have been afraid of losing my identity, which is my uniform. It may sound silly to some, but I think anybody who's worn a, a uniform, including you, Madam President, in the military, will agree your uniform, even if you wear it once, becomes your identity. I have been shamed, slandered, harassed, kicked, beaten, and denied jobs since 18 years old to get into the profession that I've always wanted to do since I was probably six, seven, or even younger. I have sweated for those who were openly gay until now within my profession where I've seen them be slandered and harassed and teased and talked about behind their back and not offered to go to events with their other fellow family members in uniform simply because of their gender identity or their sexuality. It's high school 101 for adults. And this does not occur in just the uniform public safety profession. It occurs everywhere. Madam President, you refer to multiple times what's happening in the East Coast and in the Middle West of our, of our country. It's horrific, it's 2022. We're telling kids right now that can't say the word gay that we're standing in solidarity for them. But in San Francisco, we're taking a step backwards, telling uniformed public servants that they cannot express their LGBTQ identity, my uniform, in San Francisco. To me, that is horrific. To me, that is painful. There were words such as angry and hate. I despise the word angry. I despise the word hate because I've seen people in their worst moments. I've held the hands of every single race and sexuality and gender identity you can think of as they've died most of which here in San Francisco in my 32 career. And when they're looking you in the eyes, they don't see gender identity. They don't see sexuality. They see somebody who is comforting them. And that person is in a uniform. I told Manny today on the phone that I truly believe public safety across the nation has failed ourselves and has failed the communities we serve by not having these open dialogues that we have now. During that conversation, Manny, and I'm not throwing you out negatively, brought up a great point. I know the members of Pride Alliance, or I'm sorry, of Pride Committee. I tend to be siding with them right now. And that was at the beginning of our conversation. I said, you need to know us. You need to know the people inside this uniform just as if you're walking down the street, as we've all seen a naked man or woman walking down the Castro. Oh my gosh, at first, right? And then maybe go up and shake their hand. I've gone and shake their hands. I want to know who they are and what their story is. I want them to know that if they ever have a problem, they can come up to me and say hello. All right? That's the truth. And I've done that both in this uniform and with my partner of 16 years walking through the Castro hand in hand. In closing, and I know we're going over an hour here, and I'm hoping we'll be able to extend that. San Francisco Fire Department has been planning this pride since 2020. 
our chief is the first openly lesbian fire chief that we know of in this nation. All right. We we had we had shots of man a few words. We had exactly we had lots of things, and we still have lots of things planned for this pride to reflect our LGBTQ members of our department, members of the police department, and our communities that we actually support wholeheartedly and 100 percent Uniformed police officers are going to be in the event staff. Uniformed police officers are going to be staffing recruitment booths. Uniformed police officers are going to be lining the perimeter of the parade and walking the parade for our safety, as well as uniformed firefighters. Lieutenant, I will ask you to perhaps form it into a question. 30 seconds. Soon. The, if you have a question, which also for folks is understanding, this is the, he is the spokesman for the fire department. So his job is to communicate on behalf of the entire department. And I'm passionate for this grieve this great lack of communication that we've seen in the past that we're fixing today. So again, I'm winded. I have lots to say, but I'm going to wrap it up. Your uniformed police officers, and again, your uniformed police officers who are reflecting the change of the LGBT community so smallly by simple baby steps are the ones who are volunteering to march, including the fire department, with zero compensation to reflect our community and our pride. My question, not to the Madam President or Police Officer Winters or owner of this fine establishment, Manny, is to this community. At what point do we put our foot down, embrace the person next to you, give them a handshake, give them a hug, let them know who you are and what you're about so that we could all move forward from these shenanigans that we're seeing here that are ruining pride, not only for me, not only for my department, for my fellow LGBTQ members in uniform, but for our entire community. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. A couple things. Uh, one, thank you, Lieutenant, for sharing your story and also for announcing publicly for the first time in 50 years that you're a gay man. And I think all of us, all of us queer folks in the audience have to at least, at the very least, understand that that takes a lot of courage. We've all been there. Um, I did give you a little more time to speak because you do represent the entire department, though for future questions, maybe uh, a little bit less. And I do want to give Suzanne the opportunity to respond to that. I know it wasn't directed at her, but I want to give you the opportunity to respond to what the lieutenant just said, in particular, that my identity is my uniform and that you can't asking someone to take their uniform off is, is, is actually asking them to strip their whole identity. So please, I want to give you the opportunity to respond to what Lieutenant Baxter just said. Well, first of all, I'd like to honor your service. We appreciate that. We want you to show up. Um, I would say there are members of our community that don't have that privilege to represent the fire department, to make the decision to put the uniform on or off. They wear the uniform 24 seven. That's who they are, it's their identity. I personally, in the queer community around people all the time, that don't feel safe because of who they are. And it's not what they wear. It's who they are. And I don't have all those representatives here today. They're not here. They don't have that privilege. I do. And I've been entrusted to carry that message to you all who have the power, who have chosen to put the uniform on, who have chosen to be community members, just like me. I'm, I'm a community member. I show up. Nobody from San Francisco Pride, other than the staff and the contractors, the board of directors is unpaid. They volunteer year round. They made a tough, tough decision, knowing full well that we would come into rooms like this and people would be angry with them. But I'm really proud. I'm really proud of those people and they are trying to do what's right. You may not agree with it, but they're trying to do what's right. All right, let's move to the next question real quick. One thing real yes, quick. please go ahead, um, officer. And I understand that there's a lot of people here who are from police department or fire department. Uh, one thing I would really like is that we respect some of the members of the community. I would like to hear from members of the community first before anyone who's 
firmly in the police or fire side. Speak yep. up. Yep. Um, because that's who I want to have dialogue with. Let's go right here in the front in the plaid, please. Ooh. Precious, Precious is coming with a wireless mic. And the only, I guess the good thing about the uniform is I kind of know who I'm calling on next. So let's, <laughs> let's go ahead. And then uh, right behind you, Precious has a microphone. Thank you so much. I was going to say, how are you? Thank you. But, okay, let me get back. First of all, I want to thank you for this opportunity. Since uh, I, rep I am on the board of the Castro Cultural District, and I want to share with you, it was a very difficult moment, even for us on that board, because here we are, are we, are we going to stand up with our LGBTQ community or our police force, which I personally am very grateful for your services. I say that to you, I am not a white person. I'm an Iranian Muslim lesbian woman who's lived in San Francisco for 27 years. I am aware of the, of the discriminations and so forth, and yet I have this fundamental belief, being here 27 years, that Pride March is, in, you're entitled to march no matter who you are. And we, we, that's what San Francisco has been to me. So it was really heartbreaking. It was really heartbreaking to wake up to the mayor's uh, announcement that they have that she had decided to not march because for many reasons and it really I'm not angry I'm disappointed and and sad that we are here that we have to take these positions that are really complicated and I agree with Manny I wish that it wasn't picked up in this platform this is a conversation that we should be having every day in places like Manny not in the pride march that said um <laughs> I wanted to tell you that you mentioned something about the white power people are showing up and making noise. I want to also tell you that as a, a woman of color, I do not feel safe to actually say that I'm okay with the police officers marching with their uniform because my community shames me too. So I want to in encourage us to have hard conversations, honest conversations, rather than taking these positions just because we just want to take those positions. This is complicated. It is emotional. I, I cannot imagine being a police officer knowing that we're in, in these hours. I'm not talking about the entire police, because that's a whole different conversation. We're talking about the LGBTQ police officers in the city of San Francisco. We're not talking about those cops that we, we see what they're doing out in the world to our people. So I want to thank you, first of all, Manny, for, for coordinating this. I am glad that we're having this conversation. I wish we were having these town halls in which it gives the voice to people like me before these decisions were made. So I wanna ask you, and I'm gonna, how are we gonna make it? Because we need to make a compromise. This is not, this is damaging our community and our, our actually worldview right now. San Francisco is a center issue right now on this. And they're gonna use it again against us, not for us. So how are we gonna do this? <laughs> thank you. Um, if you'd thank like to, you, thank you very much for sharing that. And this is a community forum and, and sharing is good too. And I think it's healthy and, and cathartic to do that. If you wanna answer the question of how can we get a compromise, you can. I did feel like I did ask that. So um, maybe if there's anything new, you don't have to ask. And then um, if, if any of you are leaving, do you have anything you wanna ask before you leave? No, you're good? Okay. All right, great. They have no. a fire to go put out? Okay. Literally. All right. Uh, next question. I would love to have someone maybe who's part of the force ask the next question if there is one in the back Do, or any in a comment that you have. No? Okay. No. All right. Uh, and maybe if you are, you're not in uniform, so if you are part of the force, maybe just let us know. Okay. I feel like uh, Star my name Wars. Is Roderick Elton. I'm a trans man. I've been in this department since 2007. Which uh, department? This department, San Francisco. And we do police, trainings. though? Yes. Okay. Yes. And we do trainings together um, and been doing them for many decades now. But my question was to clarify, when you brought up the, 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 the route is going to be staffed by police officers in uniforms, but it seems like the only erasure is going to be the officers and our allies. And we have so many allies that also come out and our children and everybody else are going to be the ones who are not in the parade, but yet will be everywhere around it. And I don't understand how that makes any sense. Okay, so how, how, how can we have officers along the whole route every 20 feet, yet not actually in the parade? I don't understand how that works. Okay, and just for time check, I know we've gone over, we're going to maybe do this for like six or seven more minutes, maybe 10 max, because we do have an event after this, which is running over time. Thank you for asking that question, Suzanne. Uh, there's no choice. Um, there have to be police at the event. We would not be able to get the permit. We would not be able to get insurance. 
So that's a non-starter. The only thing that I have power over, or not I, the board of directors has power over, is the makeup of the contingents of the parade and rules around that. So that's why that that's not an issue. And I, I, I don't, I think that's disingenuous. We know that they have to be there. If I had my, if I had my, like, if I got all like I wanted, then I would try to make it less military, less militarized. I would try to change it a little bit, but that's not us. And we, when we were in this, started this conversation, um, we didn't understand that Catherine let us know that if they were going to be identified as police officers, they had to have weapons. But that was a non-starter. And we, we honored that. We, we, okay, we understand that. If we, it makes sense to us. I don't like that societies like that. So I, you know, I don't, I, they have to be there. We're working with them. We, we owe them that they are protecting us, but that's what they signed on for. That's, that's your job, I think. All right, let's get one more question uh, in. Oh, Manny, yes, I please. Just issue Catherine. a point of clarification. This may be some miscommunication on the board because at a certain point, uh, so the fact that you said that we could still have uh, our gun belts with us, we were actually told by a board member that it was t-shirts and no gun belts. If, okay, it, so if it had been polos with like pride patches and like the bottom part of a uniform, we wouldn't be here today. We'd be, we'd be, we're going to, we have a parade contingent. Let, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's just pause. I want to make sure I heard that properly. So if you're saying you could wear, you could wear a polo with your patches. Even though we know how we feel about polos. <laughs> but, but it's, a shirt, it's, a shirt, a gun and a patch. You would be okay with that. I, I, I feel I could get my pride alliance to say, yeah, if we could have that, we could march. And I, I'd ask my, my LGBT. Yeah. Oh. Hold on a second. Okay. Uh, I, and I actually want to answer that question. Okay, you can answer that, but I. Yeah. But are there any reactions that you have to that? No, I mean, San Francisco Pride in everything we said never said anything about weapons. We never told the police they can't have weapons. We said full uniform. Okay, whatever was said before, yeah. I honestly yeah. don't care. Yeah. Like here we are now, <laughs> it's June 1. And what you're saying I'm just, is- I'm like shocked, what, I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> okay, but it's fine. But we're here now. It's an everyday a new beginning. Yeah. So what you're saying is if you had a gun, you, you, you were able to, a t-shirt, a polo, something that not, but you wore your pants, you, you would feel more comfortable. You would feel comfortable marching your private I, I, I could probably sell that to my members. Yeah. Okay. Um, and someone asked about guns over here. And oh, yeah. I, would be, explain, I, I really want, I want to answer that question. And, and can we let her ask her full question? Please, please. Yeah. Or them. I don't want to. Or them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess the question, sorry, I blurted it out. Um, yeah, in, so the, no, in the heat of no. the moment. Um, the question is like, why guns? Why the show of force? And actually, I, I guess a bigger question is that for coming in uniform, coming with your weapons, I think that puts you in an elevated position of power. And that's where the community starts feeling uncomfortable. It sounds like the community and the Pride Board didn't ask you not to come at all. They just asked you to come at a level that made everyone feel comfortable. And I think the weapons in general, like, that is also a show of force. So even just not having the uniform, the gun still puts you in a position where you are in power. Okay, but the question in particular though is, the question in particular why was, is it important? Why is the gun yeah, important? Why, why do we need to have our gun belt? And, and, and it comes down to kind of a, the issue of if we are out there presenting ourselves as police officers, even though we're off duty, um, if something were to happen that required police response, um, if we weren't properly equipped, we would have to, to run from helping people rather than running to help people. Um, as we know, in the tragic incident of Aldi, you know, officers didn't run to, and we, as San Francisco, have trained differently and prepared differently for, for incidents that present, uh, you know, large scale risks to the public. And, um, like if we look back at UPS officers ran towards that incident um, and saved, a lot, saved lives. And so it's basically the perception is that we're there and if something were to happen, which hopefully will never happen, um, one Pulse nightclub is enough and hopefully we will never have another. Um, okay. We would wanna be there for our community. Here's what I'm sensing from my perspective in the audience. There's a lot more questions, but folks have come here to tell their coming out stories 20 minutes ago. And I really do want oh, to honor okay. that. Yeah, that's so, that's so. So I'm sorry because I know there's a lot more to talk about, but I I want to honor everyone's time. And so what I'd like to do now is just say thank you, thank you for being here, thank you.